it ain't the left side or the right side, then it must be the fin side. It ain't the left side or the right side, then it must be the fin side. Left. Listen, and that was Zola V here kicking us off for another ep- another season of On the Fin Side here with Paul Pickin and Brian Catanzaro. It's a whole new year. I'll be hosting on a full-time basis. Brian Miller, our esteemed host for the last eight years, is going to be calling in and contributing periodically. He and his uh, lovely wife have a son, and they've actually adopted two more this year. Needless to say, uh, Brian has his hands full quite a bit, but he's still as big of a Dolphins fan as before. Still going to be joining us periodically, but as you can imagine, his availability has shrunk a little bit. Paul, uh, you know, I, I always hate starting off a, a show by saying, hey, how you doing? But, uh, you know, we haven't talked Dolphins football here on the airwaves for about three months. How are you? What have you been up to this summer? I've um, been doing a lot. Um, helping out with some new sports stuff around, all kinds of different stuff. Really waiting to get back to football, man. It's I, I miss doing the show. I'm glad to hear we're back on the air. I've done a couple of interviews with the Dolphins through our partnership we have with them, which has been a lot of fun. So it's, uh, yeah, but it's been good, man. How about yourself? Just about the same. You know, uh, this is the time where I recharge. I don't like any other sports except football. I may go to a St. Louis Cardinals game here once in a while, but that's about it. Uh, so other than that, I'm recharging the batteries, understanding the rosters, the depth charts, and the off season, so we can hit the ground running now that uh, a training camp has kicked off. So looking at the Dolphins off season, Paul, what did you like most and what would you have done differently? Here's the kicker. We can't mention, talk about three names. Laramie Tunzel, Lamar Miller, and Adam Gase. There's a method to my madness. Anytime I ask a question of what would you have done differently or what did you like from the offseason, it always goes back to these three answers. So taking those three, Tunzel, Lamar Miller, and the Dolphins coaching staff out of the equation, what did you like and dislike about the offseason? Wow, there there was a lot. Um, I mean, I love the fact that in the draft this year, and and while I won't point at the Tunzel pick because it actually falls outside of what I, the point I want to make here anyway. I love the fact that whether you like the picks or not, Miami took a lot of pieces that signify that whomever this coaching staff is, the Shelby not be named, um, but signify that they're looking to create mismatches on the offensive side of the ball in particular. Uh, guys like Thomas Duarte, Jakeem Grant, uh, Kenyon Drake, who I didn't love the pick at the time, but once I saw the bigger picture, I kind of like the fit of this guy. Guys like Leontay Carew. These are guys that can come in and really create some havoc if used appropriately. And the fact that Miami took so many of these guys signifies to me that they are looking to utilize these guys as those complementary pieces that are going to cause a lot of mismatches, which leads to a lot of points and a lot of headaches for defense. No one will ever be able to say that Ryan Tannehill did not have the offensive weapons around him. Uh, if, especially after this off season, you know, you've got Devonte Parker and Jarvis Landry and, and Jordan Cameron coming back. And now you've added some really good pieces. Kenny Stills is going to be in his second year in the offense. Leonte Carew in the third, Kenyon Drake in the third, uh, Jakeem Grant in the sixth and Duarte in the seventh, like you mentioned, a yeah, big mismatch uh, differences this year. Yeah, my, my thing. So Paul, uh, taking a look, at this as well. What would you have done a little bit differently this offseason? I, I would have liked to have seen them really prior to the offseason start reworking some of the contracts that uh, for some of the guys that let go, like Miller, who I don't want to harp on. Yeah, I, I would have liked to have seen them do a little bit more to shore up the cornerback position. Uh, they've got a lot of young promise there, but outside of Byron Maxwell, they really don't have much as, as far as proven talent at the corner position. Um, and then... Uh, Given the injury history with their starting three at linebacker, I would have liked to have seen them go out and at least strengthen the depth just a little bit, even though I like some of the young promise behind those guys. Yeah, I, you know, looking at the offseason, what, what I definitely liked was a greater emphasis on getting bigger on both sides of the ball. On the defensive side, yeah, Olivier Vernon goes to the Giants for an insane amount of money, but they, they plug Mario Williams right in there at 6'5", 300 pounds. Uh, you have also have next to Sue at the defensive tackle position, you have Jordan Phillips returning, and at the defensive end spot to help Cameron Wake, especially on rundowns, you pick up 
the 300 pound Jason Jones, who's familiar with Jim Washburn. And you also have, uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, Andre Branch, who, you know, was a little bit disappointing with the, with the Jaguars, came to us on kind of a one year prove it deal uh, with, with them. I, I like the emphasis on getting bigger on both sides of the ball. I like the, the signing of uh, Issa Abdul Qutis to, to really pair with Rashad Jones in the secondary. Like you, Paul, the cornerback spot, Casey Hayward is a player was with the Packers, signed with the Chargers this offseason for about $5 million. Here, Patrick Robinson, I would have loved to shore up that cornerback position before the NFL draft. Then it may have, may have given the Dolphins the flexibility in the second round. Maybe you take Xavier Howard still. Maybe you take Mackenzie Alexander at that corner spot. But you also have the, the ability to really uh, take the best player available. Another thing, too, I, I wish that in the draft Mike Tannenbaum had not spent so many Hicks trying to move up to get, quote, his guys. You know, trading up for Xavier Howard was one of them, and they blew an opportunity to get a fourth-round pick next year by trading their fifth-rounder this past year. But long story short, the Dolphins could have had, after the compensatory formula was com- was completed, an extra three, two fours, and a six next year, which would have given them some ammunition to trade up in a more valuable draft. Another thing I would have changed a little bit, Derek Shelby was a player I was really starting to like and really starting to to go with uh, signed four years, twenty one million dollars, I believe, with the Falcons. And at that defensive end spot, I, I thought he was turning into a very good player. And if you re-sign him for five million a year, uh, even if he hadn't been a great defensive end, he'd still be a, a player that could be your third end and, and a backup defensive tackle for you. Yeah, and it, it's funny you mentioned Derek Shelby, and you mentioned Olivier Vernon before. I wasn't really sad to see Olivier Vernon go. Um, you know, congratulations to him. He got that massive contract from the Giants. We'll see him this Friday, most likely, for a few plays. But honestly, he wasn't a complete player to me. He was a one-trick pony. And uh, I think there are going to be a lot of Giants fans that end up ruining this move. Derek Shelby was actually, as you pointed out, the defensive end that I was more sad to see leave. He was a guy that really over the past two or three seasons has been an ascending player and an ascending talent. And Miami really could have gotten him back at a pretty decent discount. And I think he could have been a higher component than some of the backups that they that they currently have on this roster and, and may have made it less of a necessity to go out and get one of those guys, which while I do like them being here, I actually do like the idea of Shelby a little bit better because he was able to complement the players around him very well in both the run and the pass. He was, and Shelby was a solid player across the board. And I thought when you look at Cameron Wake, there was a time between when Joe Philbin and, and Kevin Coyle were fired and then Lou Anarumo and Dan Campbell took over. In those two, in those two and a half games that Wake platooned with Shelby, he had seven sacks. They really had something going there because the reality is Wake is going to be playing 30 to 35 defensive snaps a game. You would think to keep him fresh, and Shelby could have been that guy on first down. Hopefully Jason Jones and or Andre Branch pick up the slack. If we, if we had said during the 2015 season that Olivier Vernon was going to get the richest defensive end contract in the history of football, we, people would have probably said we're crazy. Well, I bet, I bet you David Cantor would have told us if, uh, if we had had him on at that point in time. He would have been, you know, good, good, bad, or different. Cantor does manage to get his clients, uh, while, while it usually ends up being a ticket out of Miami, he does end up getting them paid like they, they more than deserve, I guess, we'll go with. That's the problem. It's usually gets them paid with somebody else. But, you know, the the reality is with Olivier Vernon, we had him on the show a year before Vernon signed with the Giants, and they we asked him if they had been in contract, contact with him about OV, and the answer was a flat no. And at that time, Vernon and the Dolphins were looking at, you know, OV wanted – what, $10 million a year? He ends up getting $17 million the next offseason. Anyway, OV is in the past. Good luck to him in, in New York. Looking at, uh, looking at the rest of our roster here this offseason, cleaning up a few rough edges since we've been on the show in, in mid-May, Deion Jordan reinstated back into the NFL. He can rejoin the team now, must get a go-ahead from the NFL prior to week one. Paul, uh, your thoughts on Deion Jordan being back with us? Um, he was a guy I really liked um, before all of the mess will go with. He was a guy that was underutilized by Joe Philbin, who seemed to hate using rookies. Uh, we won't be, beat a dead horse with that. But I remember we were down in Miami for, for the Bills game uh, at Web Weekend, and then I actually flew home, and 
that week I went and caught the, the Dolphins and Patriots game and seeing live, watching Deion Jordan when he was in that first half. He was disruptive when he rushed the passer, but there was another element to him that a lot of people missed because, let's face it, passes not thrown to a player don't really get a huge amount of airtime. When he was covering Rob Gronkowski, he was doing something in that first half that I haven't seen many people do, and he was basically eliminating Rob Gronkowski on the plays he was covering it. Yeah, and when you look at Gronkowski, one of the best tight ends in the NFL, uh, to do that and to trust a player to, to do that is, is incredible. And Deion Jordan showed up at camp, which impressed me, at 6'6", 275 pounds. And he was much lighter than that before, and he looked like a solid 275. What didn't impress me is that he didn't get his paperwork in until red flag. So, you know... Jordan, if he's healthy and he's back and he's contributing, even like he was two years ago, we have a rotational player and a very good special teamer who can play defensive end and linebacker. Uh, right now, I think that's where the Dolphins need to leave it with Deion Jordan in terms of responsibilities, because otherwise, this could be this up to this point has been another Justin Blackman or Alden Smith, a player who really has not uh, done the best thing for himself, which is why he's been suspended a year and a half out of two years. But it's good to see right now that he's saying and doing the right things. Paul, the Dolphins also made big news by signing former Texans running back Arian Foster. And we had the displeasure of seeing him in Miami uh, this past year where he actually tore his ACL during the Dolphins game. This is a, a perennial a couple of years ago, a perennial Pro Bowl running back, coming off injury, hitting that dreaded age of 30 years old. Dolphins signed him for uh, the contract. If Foster doesn't make the team, he'll get $400,000. If he does make the team, he'll get at least a million and a half. Could be worth up to three and a half million with incentives. Paul, do you like the signing? I do. I think he's a guy that could come in, be a very good complimentary back to Jay Ajayi. I do think J.J. is going to be the starter. I think if you split 30 to 35 touches a game between those two with a slightly higher share going to Ajayi and a couple others going to whoever ends up being behind them, I think that's something that really could be explosive in this offense and could keep both Ajayi and Foster healthy and effective. Plus, it's from a mentorship perspective, Foster's not a bad guy to have in there helping a young guy like Ajayi out. Foster turns 30 here in just a couple of weeks on August 24th. Yeah, I like the signing, too. I mean, I've, ne I've always been one that's thought Arian Foster's a little bit overrated because he played in the Gary Kubiak downhill running system that benefited him, benefited the Broncos like Mike Anderson and Landis Gary, Clinton Portis, Terrell Davis back when he was with Denver. But if for nothing else, Arian Foster's going to come in here and he's going to be a professional if he stays healthy. Uh, he'll be good in pass protection. He'll understand the concepts of the passing game. And right now, at this point, we're not sure if Jay Ajayi and Kenyon Drake can do that, too. So we'll be interesting with Arian. He'll take that vaunted number 34 that, that Ricky Williams used to have as well. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. So we'll get to that, too, throughout the offseason as well. Yeah, and one, one cool thing, I think, as well, with, with the team this year, with Ari Foster, with Jay Ajayi, and whoever else is in that backfield, is we spent a lot of time last year watching an offensive line that was having to go to kind of a bare cupboard worth of, of, of depth behind the starters because there weren't really two straight games throughout the season where we had all five offensive line starters and had them healthy. Um, Miami set up this off season, and I know we talked about what things that we liked earlier, but this is something that we should really touch on. They set up not only to get those five guys back that they're going to be starting here, uh, but also they solidified a lot of depth. They've been working, and believe it or not, there's been a lot of positive feedback about Dallas Thomas coming out of camp. And not to joke, they'll be like, well, we really, we really like this guy because you know, he, he, he looks kind of good out there. Um, but actual tangible feedback on, on his play thus far and the way he's been picking it up. You've got Jermon Bushrod came in, who, if not for injury, would have still been a starter up in Chicago. You've got a lot of depth along this offensive line, not to mention, I, I know we won't harp on it, but Larry Tunsil coming in and really potentially being that left tackle of the future once he settles in a little bit of guard. So they've got a lot of movable depth, but very good depth, and that can only help guys like Tannehill. It can only help guys in the running game and it can only help 
basically the entire offense. You nailed it on that. I mean, looking back at offense, the offensive line of the previous years, every year the Dolphins, either by injury or by lack of talent, have always had two or three liabilities on their offensive line at all times. Last year it was Dallas Thomas and Jason Fox. The year before that it was Dallas Thomas and what Samson Satelli and – a uh, year before that, we had at one point Tyson Plabo and Jonathan Martin as our bookend tackles, Sam mm-hmm. Brenner in there somewhere. So what I like is talent-wise, the Dolphins do have uh, five starting players, and they've also got a handful of backups, too, where at least if you put them in there, then you're not, not screwed. Exactly. And I really, really like the depth they went out and grabbed this offseason. They're going to have some talented players that, that end up on the chopping block. And I'm okay with that. I'd rather have that than basically be like, all right, which, which guys that really don't cut it are we going to keep? Which I know we've ended up having in the past few years, and, and, and that's drove me insane. So I'm actually looking forward to seeing that line play because that combined with some of the mismatches we see them setting up to create on offense could lead to some really exciting things on the offensive side of the ball when, once they get everything together over on the outside. Yeah, it, it might take a while, especially with if Tunzel is going to seize that starting left guard job. Continuity of the offense in general is going to be a big thing. And speaking of that, Paul, you know, looking at these training camp reports from, you know, the Omar Kellys and Armando Silgueros, James Walkers, people that are really there in Miami at, at training camp, it sounds like the offense is off to a rocky start, which doesn't really surprise me, especially uh, among the offensive line against this defensive line. Uh, I've heard a few things uh, so far. What has, from the training camp reports, really jumped out to you at this point? Honestly, I, I always expected these guys to be ahead of the offense at this time uh, during the offseason. If, if they're not, that usually signifies a problem, more so on your defensive side of the ball that it does good things for the offensive side of the ball, especially learning a new offense uh, with Tannehill finally having the ability to audible, which I know has been beaten to death. Uh, I, I, there are a lot of things that, that I don't pay attention to that Omar Kelly says, to be honest with you. He, he put a report out there saying he didn't really watch because he doesn't pay attention to those kind of things with several different players and position groups. And it's like, wait, those are the starters, and, you, and you're a beat reporter. You didn't pay attention while you were in practice to what they were doing at all, ever, throughout the entire day. Would you know that that's something that people <laughs> want to hear about? Not, not a bit, not once. Okay. Well, and, well said. And, and I'd like to apologize to you, Paul, for bringing his name up on the show. You know, I, Omar in person, <laughs> I like. I do. Um, I just, I, I, I don't have time for writers that, especially paid writers, that don't make their living providing accurate coverage. They make their living providing sensationalism and controversy. Uh, it doesn't help anybody, and it really doesn't help the fan base selling tap boy newspaper. Yeah, well said. And, you know, a few things I've heard out of camp, and not specific, specifically from him, but in general, uh, two guys that have really stuck out are Chris McCain and Billy Turner, uh, defensive end and right guard. Really like to hear that because I would have been tremendously disappointed if Billy Turner did not seize this right guard spot uh, going up against Jermon Bushrod. You know, because uh, I thought Billy Turner really got, and I'll quote CK on this from last offseason, Billy Turner tends to get painted with a a broad broad brush of general unhappiness with the offensive line, especially the interior of the line, you know, with Mike Pouncey's injury and with Dallas Thomas' injury uh, of of years past. But I thought when Billy Turner got in there, which he should have for the first two and a half years we had him, I thought there were games where he looked really rough. There were games where he looked great. So if you can eliminate those penalties, then I I think you've got something there. But what I like about Turner and Tunzel, if you can get them up to speed, you have two players who have the physical traits to do everything you ask of them. Right, and they they both have positional flexibility. Um, And and same a little bit with with a guy like Samuel Douglas, who I know struggled a little little bit during his rookie year last year, but also showed some promise. Um, a couple other really quick things that I've heard really good out of training camp. Jakeem Grant keeps popping eyes. Uh, apparently he had, I think, two long receiving touchdowns today and looked pretty good in the return game as well. He, he's a guy that I'm super excited about this, this upcoming season, even though he's basically the size of a flea out there compared to everybody else. Regardless, I, I'm excited about the things that I've heard. I, I like the fact that the coaches are getting involved and when the offense struggles, they're, they're doing push-ups right with the offense. Little things like that, some of which we saw out of, out of guys like Dan Campbell last year. But 
in a better way um, as part of a more complete package, not just a one-off thing. So I really like a lot of different things that I've seen and heard this far. Yeah, and problems, any problems with the offense so far, don't surprise. I don't care about that on August 8th. If we get to the end of training camp and the, and the off, offense is getting smacked around by the defense, they're on practice, maybe I'll have more of a problem with it. But uh, that and overall, I've heard great things about the defense, it's, except maybe uh, opposite Byron Maxwell. You know, it's it does scare me that we've got Chemdi Chakwa and Tony Lippett starting right now opposite uh, Byron Maxwell. You know, it really took a, Xavier Howard at this point, if he's not going to be ready based on reports till the end of August, that's a pretty big setback because the expectation was that Howard was going to come in here, take his lumps as a rookie, but be in there ready to play at week one. I agree. Um, I could have said it better myself. Like I said, that I worry about the depth of that second corner position. There's a lot of young promise, but, but a lot to be shown. Um, uh, join us on Facebook and on Twitter on the Fin Side. We are going to be here until about another nine months. So if you had a that just got pregnant now, by the time your baby comes out, we're going to be wrapping up the following off season. So we're going to be with you here every week filed with Miami Dolphins covers throughout the preseason, into the regular season, as well as through the, the entire off season up past the NFL draft. Yeah. Show all across the globe. Fin ain't the left side. 